You're watching Reason Live, streaming to you from Los Angeles. The following is a live, unedited conversation between the host, the guest, and the online audience. If you'd like to participate, please leave your question in the YouTube chat. The views expressed by guests and the audience members in this discussion do not necessarily reflect those of Reason. And now your host, Zach Weissmuller. Hello, thank you for joining us on day two of five of this live stream experiment. Uh, and we are gonna be talking with Lenore Skenazy today. She is the original free range parent, uh, at one time dubbed America's worst mom. And you're gonna see why in just a second. But we are gonna be talking with Lenore in just a few minutes. But first, for those of you who are back for this second day, Thank you for participating. Um, and remember, this is a participatory forum, so ask questions in the chat and we'll be sure to get them to Lenore. This is a bit of an experiment. Uh, we're just trying it out for this first week. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what kind of feedback we get. And we'll see what kind of viewership we get. And if it's worth continuing, we'll do it uh, on a less regular basis in the new year, maybe more something like once a week. And it doesn't always have to be me in this host seat. We can have a rotating host. And just to give you a little preview of what's coming the rest of this week, I'm thinking of this as a little bit of a, a sample platter. So a little bit of uh, something different. Yesterday, we had Josiah Zayner talking about biohacking using uh, cheap technology to change your own genome and the implications of that for us and the world. Today, we're talking about Lenore Skenazy about how to maximize your own child's freedom. And th this is going to be great for parents, but even if you're not a parent, uh, it, it, it should be relevant to you because children become adults. And we are now dealing with the consequences of children who were raised by helicopter parents. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're gonna talk a little bit about the philosophy of free range parenting and about Lenore's new project, Let Grow. Uh, she's partnered with the social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt on that. Uh, it's pr some pretty exciting stuff. So we'll get to that. And then tomorrow, we're gonna to be talking with Rick Doblin, who founded MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Science. And there is some really exciting stuff happening in the area of psychedelic research. And we are on the brink of seeing these things legalized for medical use, and then we'll see where it goes from there. So I'm excited to talk with Rick, and that one's gonna be at 1 p.m. Uh, 1 PM Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And then Friday, uh, I wanna mention this, we're gonna be bringing Reason's own Nick Gillespie on, and we're gonna touch on a subject we already touched, which was postmodernism. And I'm bringing that up only because I want to start soliciting questions for that now. We've already gotten some, some interesting feedback to that that we'll be responding to. But if you have any questions for Nick on that topic, questions at reason.com is where you would send those. And now uh, we're going to get into the conversation with Lenore. But I want to start by playing a clip from a Reason TV documentary produced by Jim Epstein with Lenore that I think will give you a sense of what free range parenting is, where Lenore is coming from, and then we'll come back and get right into the conversation with Lenore. So sit tight. Several years ago when my son was nine, he asked if he could ride the subway by himself and my husband and I let him. I wrote a column about it and two days later I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, NPR. I had obviously struck a nerve. What did you think about your mom letting you have this opportunity? I was like, finally. <laughs> Nobody could believe that a decent mother would let her son go underground by himself and let him find his own way home. To me, it was letting him have a little independence that he was ready for. Thousands of blog posts later, I wrote the book, Free Range Kids. I have a television show now called World's Worst Mom. That's me. So I started a business. Call me if you're really nervous, and I will send your kids outside while I lock you indoors. It's as simple as that. And I've done it several times, and it just works. It works because reality breaks through this gigantic fear. 
that's been foisted down parents' throats that they have to be worried about their kids every single second. So it all started with that subway ride, Lenore, and uh, your son was nine, year old, nine years old at that time. So yeah. by my back of the envelope math, that he is eight, how old is he now? 18? No, he's 20. He's 20. 20. He's off okay. of college. Oh, actually, he's off on, uh, off on a vacation. Off on a vacation. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. he he turned out okay. Uh, no, no, he never got kidnapped or <laughs> <I think so. laughs> yeah, fell on the tracks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he actually got stopped a couple times uh, when he was on the Long Island Railroad as a ten-year-old for riding the rails as if he was a hobo. And what was interesting is that uh, the first time he was stopped. It was Christmas morning and they stopped the whole train. So it would have been literally 10 years ago. And the conductor refused to call me, but he called the police. And when Izzy got off at his stop, he wouldn't let the train continue on until the police had come and called me. And I had said, yes, this, this is what he's supposed to be doing. And he was uh, visiting some friends. Those friends came and escorted him uh, to their house. So that was fine. And then the same thing happened a couple of weeks later and I thought it was him pranking me because <laughs> but it, no it was the, actually the same policeman they're just sort of obsessed by uh, danger and when I said to the policeman I said look it's it's rush hour there now and you're stopping the train again um, aren't you don't you think that he's safe there's so many people there getting off the train it's just a normal day uh, it was in um, Bayside Queens and he, he said, I said, you know, you could, you could handle it. Even if there was a kidnapper, you're there, you can handle it. He said, what if there's two kidnappers? So that's when I started realizing, oh, this is going to be a challenge because rationality is not going to play a role in this discussion. You can always imagine the very worst case scenario. And at some point, somewhere in history, something terrible has happened. And you can always bring it up and say, what about that? And that's really what I've been dealing with for the last 11 years. What about that, Lenore? What about that time that something bad happened? So. And when you, you wrote about this, uh, letting your son write home for the uh, New York son in 2008 yeah. and you that kind of launched an entire movement and when you yeah. when you first did that and like when you first let your son step foot under that subway <laughs> yeah. did I, I mean obviously you didn't know all this would happen but no. did you think that this was some sort of momentous event or did did you feel weird I mean obviously you <laughs> felt it like it was uh, out of the norm enough enough to write about it, but what were you thinking as a parent when you first did that? You know, I didn't think it was out of the norm enough when we did it. When our, our son had been asking me and my husband, who you might see drifting by from time to time, if we would let him take the subway by himself, uh, get, take him someplace he'd never been before and let him find his own way home. And my husband and I discussed it and we thought, yeah, he's ready for this. This is how we get around in New York City. There's so many people on there. We think there's strength in numbers, safety in numbers. And he speaks the language, he could read a map. So we decided to let him. And when he did, it was a, it was a lovely day for our family. Our son was very proud. He was excited to be allowed to do it and to come home. He felt so grown up. Uh, but I did not write it uh, about it for like another month and a half because it didn't strike me as momentous or newsworthy, even though I was grinding out column after column and I wasn't writing about it. And then one day when I had no column to, to speak of, I said, should I write about is he taking the subway? Because by that time, I'd been talking to some of the other fourth grade moms and saying, oh, you know what is he did the other day? He took the subway home. And they're like, Huh? <laughs> and uh, that was what gave me the impetus to write about it. Not that I thought when I was originally doing it that it was something for, it wasn't an experiment, it wasn't for publicity, it was just part of growing up. And since then, it's just been uh, this, not only an incredible ride to, to start the whole free range kids thing, but to be exposed to what is normal now for children in terms of freedom and independence. and. It, it keeps shocking me. Uh, there was a piece on uh, PBS last night uh, on, on the news hour, and I hadn't seen who they'd interviewed, but they'd interviewed some kids who were um, being allowed to do a let grow project, which we can talk about later, but mm -hmm. it's being allowed to do something on their own. And the, the boy they featured for the most part was a fifth grader, and he had been on his block. He'd been allowed to be like go down the block and come back, but he had never been allowed off his block. 
And so for his exciting Let Grow project, he went two blocks. And it was the first time two blocks away, there's actually a park. So for the 10 years of his childhood so far, he'd never been allowed to go to his local playground by himself. And this was this was him, like somebody opening the, the, the cage door and finally letting him out. And, and that is not abnormal these days. It really, the, the, the limit on children's freedom is, is shocking to anybody, I'd say over 35. There, uh, there's a question that just came up in the chat that I want to ask. It's okay, uh, yeah. uh, Philip Kevinisi asks, uh, I always wondered, did Izzy suffer socially due to all the attention <laughs> over the years? No, he didn't suffer socially. Did he become it, the know, most popular it, kid he, in the school? Yeah. He's, you know, he's popular, but he's fine. He's got friends. Yeah. Uh, it, the only thing that affected him at all is that he was on TV a lot and he ended up um, going to a high school where they teach television production and he, he likes lighting. Mm -hmm. So that was it. That was the, that's the sum total of the uh, yeah. effect on Izzy. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, you mentioned that the reason that you started thinking this was perceived as abnormal is your mom friends or other parent <laughs> friends at school started yeah. you know giving you the raised eyebrows and <laughs> now yeah. it's as someone who has two young children it's yeah. there's there uh i have a, f a 14 month year old a 14 month old and a three almost three year old and uh, the three-year-old uh, just fell into a uh, duck pond this morning. So I don't know uh, if that qualifies as free-range parenting or not. But uh, the, uh, Were you there? I hope you I, were. I, I was there. I, I pulled him out. Okay. Uh, you know, he, he learned from the experience, I think. But, right. uh, you know, don't, don't lean over into a duck pond with a stick. But there's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, now, now there's social media um, and mm -hmm. there's all these parent yeah. groups and blogs and uh, mm -hmm. the reaction to me, see, that, that seems to be the sort of barometer that a lot of people are using to calibrate. Uh, that's a little bit of a mixed metaphor, I guess. But the, <laughs> have, have, have you been, um, have, have you gotten any re responses or gotten a sense of how social media is affecting parents yeah. these days uh, for uh, good or bad in terms of free range parenting? Um, I'll tell you, the, the thing that's on social media that interests me the most uh, is not the back and forth thing. And in fact, actually, we have um, we have a Facebook page called No More Helicopter Parenting, the Let Grow Support Group. It has all those names just for search engine <laughs> maximization. But um, that's a place where people are talking to each other and it's, it is very supportive. I can understand where parents, you know, like to ask questions and get the, the feel of the group. And I'm not on the other ones. So I'm not watching a lot of whether there's, you know, shaming or whatever. But the, the thing that I do collect the way other people collect baseball cards is Facebook posts written by moms who, uh, it always goes like this. I never thought it would happen to me. I was at Target or Ikea or the grocery last night with my two darling children. And I was in the, the, the frozen food aisle and down at the end was some creepy guy yep, looking I've seen at me. It. Well, we went three aisles over and there he was again. And then when I was checking out, I noticed there was another man outside with a van and the door was open. I have no doubt that they were there to sex traffic my children. And thank God I didn't glance down at my phone or I would never have seen them again. Mm -hmm. And and they write this. And of course the upshot is that literally nothing did happen. Um, really, if you, if you go through this, you see that a mother was shopping with her children and there was some other shoppers there. And, and there was actually a car in the uh, parking lot and she left and she went home. But it's written, it's always written in almost those exact words, like I didn't think it could happen, and they always say, but, and then they say, Abilene, Texas, uh, you know, Kansas City, wherever they are, they say, is the number two tra sex trafficking place in the country. Everybody's number two, because that sounds believable. <laughs> and then there is a cascade of comments underneath. Yeah. Wow, that was so close. Phew, thank yeah. God, Mama, you really did a great job. And and hold your children tight and never look away. And and that I, I really, I find extremely disheartening because people share those by the thousands. Yeah. And there's something that is um, rewarded on social media, which is the excitement of, of a near miss uh, talking about 
sex trafficking, kidnapping, and being the hero of a story. And then if you share it, you're, you're, you're sort of part of the story and you're helping to keep children safe. But actually all you're doing is adding to um, a hysteria in the country that is not uh, matched by any, any bit, any iota of reality. Because when I talk to the head of the Crimes Against Children Research Center, all they do is research crimes against children. And I asked him how many children have been abducted like this in public from their parent by a sex trafficker, and he said zero. Wow. So in terms of something that I do see So you mean sex, traffic, media, sex traffickers that, are yeah. not uh, abducting toddlers and then raising them until they're raising like a viable age? Them. And, oh, yeah. my God, again with Dora. I'm so sick of Dora the Explorer. Please take her back. Yeah, it's right. like the ransom of Richie. No, they're not doing it, and yet people feel... Um, that it's real, obviously they must feel it's real or they'd be really cynical to be spreading these rumors. And then I've, I've actually written about it a couple of times on Reason. Uh, sometimes the news media pick up these stories and they act as if they're real. Mother writes of near miss at, you know, rest stop at Ikea uh, in the, you know, in the chickpea aisle. So it's, um, you know, the news media loves that story too. And nobody seems to care whether it's based in reality or not, so long as they can get eyeballs. There's a, another good question that just came in from Christina uh, Dellinger. And this will be a good entry point to just give an overview of the free range philosophy, sure. I think. She asks, I have a one year old and I'm very interested in <laughs> raising <laughs> him free range. What would you say are the first steps with a toddler? So, but to get into that question, maybe just explain <laughs> yeah. what free range parenting is and then yeah. what is the right age to start with yeah. this? Yeah. Okay. So free range kids, which I now call let grow because my new nonprofit is called let grow, um, is, is basically old fashioned child rearing. It's knowing that, um, kids love, it's, you can look back to your own childhood and think about what you loved to do. And chances are, your parents weren't with you every single second of the day. Maybe you got to walk to school, play with friends outside, explore in the woods, build a fort, um, walk the dog. <laughs> and uh, this is just trying to renormalize what was completely, uh, boringly normal a generation or two ago. So nobody let their one-year-old free range uh, ever in the history of the world. So you're not gonna let the, the one-year-old go um, toddling out the door if they're even toddling yet. But uh, one of the things that we do believe is that we seem to nowadays replace everything or think that nothing happens naturally, that you need a class on tumbling, that you need somebody with you to, um, to walk you to school, that you can't possibly organize your own game of kickball. It should be in a, a league with a trophy and you can't um, get anything out of just noodling around, you have to en en enroll in a class. And so you have a little kid at home, you have little kids at home too. One of the things that kids really love is free time, <laughs> free time with some junk around. You don't have to spend it on expensive things. I loved the lawsuit against uh, the baby Einstein videos a few years back from the campaign for a commercial free childhood. They sued because the Einstein said, uh, these are educational videos. And they said, no, they're not. They're <laughs> now, just actually, annoying. it's really yeah. worse to watch a video than to just play with. Uh, there was a video of baby Einstein on like about water. And it's like, <laughs> You could, you could fill a bucket with water and have them play with it. They don't have to watch video. So, so you don't need expensive toys. You don't need classes. Um, your kid would benefit from some time with some other kids around. Uh, they don't need everything to be a teachable moment. They actually learn from moments they teach themselves. So you don't have to say, now you're playing with mommies. Well, don't play with battery, but battery, battery starts with Bobby, you know, honey, this is a battery. You don't have to worry about them knowing their letters and their numbers and being school ready. Uh, I'd say before seven, but I know that's a little radical, maybe before five or six, you know, you just, there's so much the kids are learning uh, from being in the world, from, you know, playing with stuff, from exploring the idea that the only way they're learning is if you can tell that they're learning something that you, you uh, that is academic is untrue. They really playing is the work of childhood. That's that's not me that said it. It's Piaget. And uh, there's one more question from the chat, and then I have another clip I want to bring in and to bring us to a slightly different topic. Uh, the question mm -hmm. is from. 
B, B question. If the overwhelming evidence that child kidnapping is not a real problem, as you say, what, uh, and that won't convince people what will? Like, in other words, how do you actually yeah. <laughs> win this argument and persuade people? Right. Um, first of all, it's not an argument. Everybody gets to raise their kids the way they see fit. I just, if, if you want to give your kids some freedom, uh, you should be allowed to uh, by law. You should be allowed to. And uh, the social norms shouldn't be such that somebody is berating you or calling 911 simply because you're walking the, letting the kid walk the dog or play outside and they don't agree with it. Um, here's what I've discovered in 11 years of talking about the same topic. Uh, nothing <laughs> convinces people. I, I can't convince people. Let's put it that way. Statistics don't matter. My fantastic statistic, which is that if you wanted your kid to be kidnapped by a stranger, do you know how long you'd have to keep them outside unattended for this to be statistically likely to happen? Do you know? No. Zach? I don't. Take a guess. How long would you have to keep the kid outside without you there for them to be kidnapped, a statistically likely to be kidnapped, which is sort of like how many lottery tickets do you have to buy before you'd be I'll, statistically likely to win the lottery? I'll say uh, tw 12 hours. Well, that would be scary. Um, no, it's 750,000 years. So people get it wrong. Let's just put it that way. Wow. Um, but anyway, so the statistics don't matter. Um, if I tell them, if I tell people, which is true, that um, anxiety rates of children are going through the roof, depression, I hate to say it, suicide rates are up. And one of the theories is that, um, you know, you have an internal locus of control when you feel that you are in control of your life. But if you have somebody who is micromanaging you, even at work, you know how tense you are, you know how miserable it is to go into work and you start feeling depressed and downtrodden. Well, imagine if somebody woke you up every day and dragged you to school and then you're there and then you leave school and then somebody drives you somewhere and then you're at a Kumon and then you're out of Kumon and somebody drives you and soon you're at ballet and then somebody takes you home and then it's time for homework and then it's time for read aloud and then it's time for putting the stickers in the book and then you go to bed. I mean, there's not a lot of um, internal locus of control. It is external. Somebody else is determining pretty much how you spend every single second of every day. And mm -hmm. to a certain extent, they're, they're grading you and judging you, certainly the school and the after school programs. So um, anyways, I can say all that and everybody nods along, but that's not what convinces people. Here's what convinces people. When the school does the let grow project, because it's really hard to get people to let go of their kids unless there's an external push. And that is the school saying that your kid's homework tonight or sometime over this week is to do something by themselves. They can go run an errand, they can ride their bike, they can walk to school, they can go next door, they can make dinner, something by themselves without you. When the parent is pushed to do something that they weren't ready to do yet because nobody has any idea when to let their kids do anything on their own anymore, everything is written in terms of it's too dangerous, too scary, too hard, but the school says let them do it and the kid does it and the kid comes home and they brought they brought a Slurpee, they got a, a loaf of bread, they had the greatest time, they come home and there's a hole in their pants because they were sliding into first with, you know, having the time of their life, that changes the parents. That's the huh. only thing that changes the parents, Experience. the pride they feel, yeah. the excitement yeah. of seeing that their kid is blossoming. It's, it's, I mean, I'll tell you story after story, a parent who I just, I would have never thought they could do it and they do it. And afterwards they're like, of course, where's my kid? Oh, I don't know. I, I send him out before. Oh, it's now. Yeah. I wonder where he is. They, they, they relax because, because something fundamental has happened. And it's not just that they're proud of their kid or they're startled that the kid wasn't taken. It's been 12 hours. Why isn't he kidnapped yet? It's what they're happy about is that they've done their job. I mean, yeah. they don't, they don't say it that way, but I think people's ecstasy at seeing their child independent was so out of whack to me with the mild thing they would have done. Like that child yesterday who walked two blocks instead of one block at age mm -hmm. 10. I can guarantee you that mom is on cloud nine. And it's because we are programmed. We are, you know, we're born to, to, to raise these kids so that they live when we aren't alive. Well and there's no proof that that will be that you've been successful until you see that your kid can do something on your own on their own and when they do
that's what changes the parents. So you're, you're the questioner, whoever you are, hi out there. Um, once you let your kid go, and if you're the person with the one-year-old, it's going to be a while. Um, but once you let your kid go and do something on their own, write me because you'll feel it. Hmm. There's a, th we have an example of that here. Uh, it's another clip from that same documentary we showed oh, at yeah. the top where you coach some parents through <laughs> letting their two children yeah. They walk home by themselves. Oh so yeah. let's take a quick look at that and then uh, analyze it a little bit. Great. I worry that if somebody saw him by himself and he was vulnerable, I, I, don't, I don't know what could happen. They've been walking for a year. They're in New York City. So yeah, they fair enough. They've got fair the enough, legs. But... And you're not that far from a grocery. Uh -huh. And it's still light out. And I don't think it's raining. Uh, could we ask them if they're game? Would you be game? Yeah, we can ask Leah and the kids and see if it's something that, that they want to do. And it's something you're game for? I'll be nervous, but if uh, if they're comfortable with it, I'll let them do it. Do you feel comfortable crossing the street? Yes. <laughs> Using the street light? Yes. Okay, that's fine. One of the reasons I think we're particularly worried about cars today is because we're with our kids all the time. And when you're with your kids, you look out for the cars, so it looks like your kids aren't paying any attention whatsoever. If you want your kids to be really safe, you can't do everything for them. You're not building a competent child. Had you not specifically asked about it and had they not brought it up, I don't think we would have probably let them do this any time in the next probably year. I think I see them coming. Do you? Yeah. Felt a little bit out of control and, you know, just hoped that, uh, that they were okay. So you said you had a uh, follow-up there uh, to yeah. that particular story. Uh, what what I, happened? Uh, it, first of all, they were fantastic. I loved that family. Uh, secondly, the dad. Uh, mostly when I, uh, you know, I did a whole television series that was similar to this, where I would meet with um, extremely anxious parents and basically hang on to them while I sent their kids out to do something. Um, and usually it was the mom who was more nervous. And this was a case where the dad was. And weirdly, the dad had grown up in Santa Fe uh, with his twin brother, riding bareback on horses through gullies, you know, the horse with no name, um, and loving his completely free range of childhood. And yet something, uh, this is why I don't blame helicopter parents, something had frozen him with fear. I mean, I was just listening, I hadn't watched this clip for a while, and I heard the two words that were so interesting. One was, um, if my child would be vulnerable. I mean, we really are, we're sort of programmed now to think of our children as vulnerable to everything, vulnerable to, you know, to bullies, to um, to scary people, to uh, to depression, to anxiety. We, we really frame children through their vulnerability as opposed to thinking of them as pretty sturdy, um, anti-fragile, competent. And he said another word, he said, oh, if they're comfortable with that. And, uh, you know, trying to bring up kids who are always comfortable is, I think, part of the problem because we've been told that, you know, if children are uncomfortable, they might be a little traumatized or it might be painful. And that's not what we should be um, giving them. We should be giving them comfort. And in fact, um, Peter Gray, who is one of the co-founders of Let Grow, said that what children need is children come with their brains ready to be wired, right? And the, and if they're in China, they'll learn Chinese. And if they're here, they'll learn uh, some English. <laughs> and, um, and what they need is play. They need all this back and forth and frustration and betrayals and losing and winning and getting lost and trying to figure things out. And when we make sure that they're comfortable all the time, you know, that is sort of the trophy culture. Uh, I lost it, but I used to have my son's eighth place trophy um, out of nine teams from uh, a teenage uh, bowling team that he was on. Anyways, if, if your goal is to make your kids always comfortable and we're sort of told that we should, it's not like parents come up with this idea themselves. This is the culture that they are swimming in. Um, then we don't get used to them being uncomfortable and they don't yet get used to feeling uncomfortable. And um, and suddenly discomfort becomes a, a real threat. Like you're making me uncomfortable, which means like you must stop because that's a threat to me. And no, being uncomfortable is just part of life. And 
actually those kids did not seem very uncomfortable walking to the no. grocery. I think they were ecstatic, but, but here's what I learned afterwards. So, um, so they went and they got the, uh, they got cranberry juice and they came back. So I, I can't remember if I was filming a, a follow-up for you guys or for somebody else, but we needed a family that had gone free range or let grow. And so I was there maybe six months or a year later. And by this point, you know, the kids were walking back and forth to school. It was no big deal. The son was staying afterwards. He'd go to the park and play baseball with his friends. I mean, it really, it is so easy to change parents. That's why the Let Grow Project is so great because, you know, it doesn't take a lot. It takes seeing the kid free, you know, competent to change the parents. But anyways, the guy said, the dad said that he had been back home to Santa Fe and he had been speaking with his nephew who is a pastor and he told him about this whole experience and how it changed him and how he didn't understand even how it had happened and the pastor said you know you always had uh, a deep faith in god uh but now you have faith in your kids and that's that's what i'm talking about mm. faith in your kids will change you faith in lenore <laughs> won't what do you do? Uh, you're in New York City. I'm in Los Angeles. This family was in New York City. These big cities seem different to people than living on the bucolic countryside. So mm -hmm. how do you navigate that if you want? Like, how do you walk that line between safety and what can be an unsafe environment and trying to give kids in these urban settings as much freedom as possible? Well, I, I think of New York City as pretty safe, although I am nervous about cars. Uh, you know, what I say is that there's there's never been a time that's been perfectly safe. And so it's always been parents' job to prepare their kid. You know, you can't prepare the path for the child, so you prepare the child for the path. And that has always involved, you know, teaching them and, and prepare, like getting them ready. Like some parents haven't taught their kids to look both ways before crossing the street. That That is our job. Uh, you have to teach kids that they can talk to strangers, but they cannot go off with strangers. That way they have the whole world to talk to and to ask for help from and to learn from, but they can't go off with anyone. They can never get in anyone's car. If anyone's bothering you, kick, scream, yell. Um, you know, teach them some landmarks. You, you go and you find if there's a decent route to school, you walk that with them. And if there's not, then you have to, you know, either go the safe routes to schools or you um, come up with an alternative. But your job is to gradually you know work yourself out of a job make sure that your kids are understanding your rules uh set boundaries uh, just like you would do at home you know yes you can do this no you can't do that well you can go this far but you can't go over there if you're going to go to friend's house after school you got to call me you got to let me know in advance so it's it's the same thing that your parents did for you mm -hmm. and it's just we have this almost amnesia uh one of the things I talk about with um, Tracy Tommaso, she's the executive director of Let Grow, is how when our moms sent us to school, and my mom had me walking to school at age five, and that was normal back then. Um, that was normal back then. That's the whole thing. There was a community that all knew the milestones. At five or six, you could start walking to school. At nine or 10, you were old enough to have a paper route. 12, 13, you were old enough to babysit. But these milestones that everybody sort of saw, they were so clear a generation or two ago, have been buried under layers of fear until the point where you can't see them anymore. And can you walk to school at five or 15? When, when Jonathan Haidt, who's, um, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, and he's another one of the Let Grow founders, does lectures, and I watched him do this three times recently, great lectures. He looks around the room of uh, the, the audience and he says, okay, anybody who's over, I think he does 35 or 40. I want, as I look across the room, I just want you to call out what age you were when you started having some free time. And he looks around the room and everybody goes, everybody, everybody's over 40, you know, seven, six, eight, six, five, all those ages. And he goes, okay. And then um, hopefully it's a mixed age group. And he'll ask, okay, anybody, I don't remember what year, I think it's born after 85. What age did you um, get some freedom? And he looks around the room and you hear 12, 15, 13, 12, 13. 
And that's a gigantic social change mm -hmm. in a generation or two. And the reason is not that these are horrible helicopter parents who are crazy nut jobs, because you don't have an entire culture filled with outliers. They are in liars. And mm -hmm. it's because they've all been told that everything is too dangerous, that their kids are what we're saying, vulnerable, um, that you have to make them comfortable. And they've been taught this. They've been taught this by the media that always takes the worst case scenario and presents it as if it's an instructive uh, thing for them to see. So remember parents, because this child was, you know, something horrible happened in Australia, hold your children tighter. And then Parents Magazine, uh, my favorite whipping boy, and if I had a copy here, I would show you. Um, Jonathan and I wrote about one of the Parents Magazine articles that drove me craziest was about how to have a play date. Like, like it's so hard. First of all, the idea that there's instructions for these drives me crazy, A. And then the instructions, B. So one of the questions that they posed it as like an advice column. And one of the questions was, your child is old enough. No, my child. My child is old enough to ha to stay home alone for a little bit, but now she has a play date over. Can I run to the dry cleaner? Mm. And Parents Magazine replied, absolutely not. Uh, you want to be there? What if there's a horrible accident? They always go to horrible accident, A. And B was, and what if there's a spat? You want to be there to make sure no one's feelings get too hurt. So a normal parent want, looking for advice from the Bible of the parenting world is told that her child cannot handle an argument with a friend and that she as the mother must be there observing this whole thing and like a referee and ready to jump in because of the horrible trauma that could erupt if the yeah. child's feelings one of the kids feelings got too hurt and then you go back to peter gray saying you know, playing is partly about your feelings getting hurt. And then I wanted to be Superman. I want to be Superman. Okay, I'll be Superman now. And you, it's it's all about negotiation and, and you know, coming to terms with, you know, dealing with other people and not always getting your way. And sometimes the ball is out and you, you wish it was in. And, and, and instead, we've been told to take all these experiences out of our kids' lives to make them happier and safer and psychologically whole and it's one of those ironies it's like being told to eat trans fats <laughs> you know it's like oops sorry yeah. we goofed and uh, G jonathan height is one of the co-founders of let grow and that's mm -hmm. an organ your new organization that we'll talk about uh in a little bit uh because i want everyone to get a sense of what you're trying to accomplish with that but yeah. he uh as you mentioned wrote the book uh, co-wrote with Fires, Greg Lukianoff, The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, based right. on this article, this Atlantic article, or an expanded right. version of this Atlantic article. And um, he is looking really at the, the results of this generation yeah. that you mentioned post-1985. Yeah. I'm right on the yeah. border. I'm 1984, so I think I might have uh, barely escaped that, uh, although <laughs> I, I have some tendencies, I'll admit. But the... Um, uh, it's so I want you, it's the culture. Uh, right? Yeah, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit um, about <clears throat> how that manifests, uh, uh, because... What we've seen, we've everyone knows about these eruptions we've seen on college campuses. And uh, I did a short video uh, about the concept of microaggressions and oh, wow. bringing in this referee. And so I want to play a, that clip from that video. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about what happens when children who are the results of helicopter parenting become not power, not helicopter parenting helicopter culture <laughs> helicopter culture okay so right because it's it's schools it's the advice right. they're getting um the american academy of pediatrics is always telling people to beware so it's it's really it's coming from all sides right and as you mentioned care. you know pol you know police officers are now enforcing a certain style of parenting so yeah we i want to get to some of the cultural and legal forces uh, in just okay. a minute, but let's take a look at this clip and then uh, talk right. about that. Occidental College in California is considering instituting a system for students to report so-called microaggressions perpetrated against them on campus. Microaggressions are statements that intentionally or unintentionally send a negative message related to someone's membership in a marginalized group. 
We visited campus to ask Occidental students if they agree that the following statements could be considered microaggressions. They've all been documented as such on a college campus somewhere in the United States. Have you heard of the term microaggression? Yeah, that's a big thing on campus. If we see large-scale violence, we can name that as a macroaggression. But the way that we devalue that violence, the way that we silence that violence, that's a microaggression. I'm asking an Asian American, where were you born? Yes. Very, very contextual, you know. That's not a microaggression, that's just asking where they were born. Telling a black student that he or she is very articulate. That is, yeah. Yes. What about saying all lives matter? Um, I think because the history behind Black Lives Matter, it's kind of like um, appropriating a statement that was created specifically to talk about um, black lives being lost to police brutality, so that is. I'm colorblind, I don't see race. Um, Possibly. <laughs> I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Qualifications aren't really the only the only thing you should consider when hiring someone. But if you're saying that the most qualified person is someone who is not a minority, you're not of a religion you believe in, then yes, that'd be a microaggression. Saying God bless you after somebody sneezes. Oh, that would be a microaggression because of different religions. Yeah, it could be a microaggression to someone who doesn't believe in God. I think that the harm there is relatively minimal. So, there's still some harm, though. <laughs> uh, I would say there's not harm, but if it's being asked, clearly someone found M Maybe mini microaggression. Perhaps. Do you see any downside to creating a database full of statements that faculty and students make to each other in terms of protecting free speech values on campus? Not in terms of protecting free speech value, but the idea of a database certainly raises eyebrows. So yes, we do need a system where we can report our experiences and that like a system of um, education or whatever. So <laughs> how did we get here? Well, um, remember I was telling you about that Parents Magazine article that said that you must sit with your child when she's having a play date because what if there's a spat you want to intervene? If you've been raised by a culture that tells you that anytime that you feel uncomfortable, sad, or hurt, uh, it is a cause for adult intervention, and it's not something that you can handle on your own, and that it's possibly huge as opposed to roll with the punch. I'm, I'm not surprised that children grow up feeling that um, a frisson of um, anger, frustration, confusion, or hurt is a cause for calling in the dean. I mean, we've, I, you remember the, you know, the, um, the fairy tale about the princess and the pea? Do you mm -hmm. know that fairy tale? I do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do, right? I mean, so there's the, the princess is the one who can feel the pea under about 13 different mattresses because that's how sensitive she is. And we've been told to raise them. We've been mm. told to raise our kids that way. Oh my God, is there a pee under that mattress? Let me take off all the mattresses and remove that pee and you know and, and flatten it out. And then we'll put these on it. How does that feel? Is that good? Because I don't want you to be uncomfortable, that word. And so if you've been told that discomfort is evidence of something being really wrong, I'm not surprised that we start saying, well, that sort of made me feel uncomfortable. Um, but the, the other thing I was thinking is that they've, we are also raising kids um, with sort of pretend dangers. We tell them that things are dangerous that aren't. Um, my, my, the thing I, I think about the most, because this is what I get the most letters from from parents, is parents who let their kids wait in the car for literally three, four, five minutes while they're picking up um, the Tylenol or a pizza, and they are charged with uh, neglect and the reason that they are charged, first of all, the reason that somebody calls 911, and then the reason it progresses from there is because uh, somebody truly believes that this is dangerous. Now, it's not, and there's no child, I don't think I can think of, who's died in a four or five minute car wait. Uh, mm. uh, children, sometimes it's tragic, sometimes children are forgotten in cars and 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 that's yeah. that's terrible, but that's very different from, you know, forgetting your kid in the car when you go into work is different from letting your kid wait in the car on the iPad while you're picking up the pizza. So if you've grown up 
surrounded by um, pretend danger uh, and you're told it is real and there are actually real world consequences, then I'm not surprised that you start confusing micro and macro aggressions. There's been, there's, there's no difference between something um, almost non-existent danger and real danger. If we're arresting parents for letting their kids walk home from the park, walk the dog, uh, then you, you, there's no grip on reality. Yeah. And, and there, as, as you're mentioning, you can get arrested for this stuff. Now you've documented and reasoned plenty of stories of parents getting arrested. I yeah. did a, a video, which we're going to show another just short clip from of oh, a man who was arrested for yeah. letting his child walk home from school. And uh, th there's, there's a question here that came in that kind of teases us up for this, that it's a good question mm -hmm. from uh, the, the old Woodful. Um, even if we want to raise free range, our kids, laws sometimes prevent us from leaving our kids in the car or letting them walk to school and citizens okay. help enforce those laws they tattle on the parent that did the bad thing uh yeah. so uh what can we do about that so let's well, let, let me let me just play this clip from yeah. mike uh because this is actually a little bit of a complicated case in in my opinion it's, it's a little bit of a bubble case uh mm -hmm. so it, it might be interesting to discuss so here's just a clip from this documentary uh based in uh, southern california mike tang was charged with child endangerment for leaving his eight-year-old son in this parking lot a mile from home it was supposed to be a life lesson the night where I dropped him off, I just wanted to reinforce that money is hard to earn and if he doesn't do a good job at school, he could end up you know, doing something like this or sleeping out here where the homeless people sleep. He dropped him not far from the recycling area and walked away. Sometimes there's a guy there and you see people on bikes, uh, they look kind of ragged, could be homeless. Mike says his son Isaac had been slacking in school the last straw was when Mike caught Isaac cutting corners on his homework by reading his little sister's book instead of his own. It's an eight-year-old kid who didn't read his book. Right. Why would you do that? Well, first of all, I've tried other things, right, and they didn't work. So that's my take on it, and I'm trying different things. If this doesn't work, I might try something else next time. About 10 to 15 minutes after dropping Isaac, Mike sent Isaac's grandfather to go pick him up. It was eight o'clock and getting dark. Turns out Isaac had already been picked up. He was in police custody. A stranger had spotted Isaac and called the cops. He said, why was I walking home? And did I know where my home was? And did you? You know how to walk home from the, the park? Yeah, I know how to walk from, from my school to my house. The cops arrested Mike and he spent the night in county jail. A jury later convicted him, and the judge sentenced him to attend parenting classes and to a 56-day work release. So that's that not ex very well. <laughs> that's not exactly the parenting decision I would have made, uh, and I think a lot of people would kind of raise their eyebrow at that mm -hmm. sort of punishment okay. for a child. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that raises an interesting question to me, because where do you draw the line between your personal distaste for a parenting decision and where the law should intervene? Well, to me, it's it is it's pretty easy to see what is actual um, abuse or neglect as opposed to a parenting decision that I might not make or that you might not make. I mean, you know what neglect is. Neglect is when you have blatant disregard for a child's welfare. This was not, you know, I haven't left my kid. Maybe I have. Maybe maybe letting my kid ride the subway was so horrible. Um, but this was anything but blatant disregard. This was a dad doing his best, maybe not doing what you or I would do or the, the viewers would do, but loving his child and trying to teach him a lesson not beating him, not starving him, not giving him drugs, not not doing anything other than saying maybe a walk home uh, in a in a route that the kid knows. Uh, that when the kid said that he knows the route from the school to his home, he passes by uh, this particular parking lot on his way daily. Uh, so to let him walk home and and think about that 
does not strike me as worthy of government intervention. And uh, to the that earlier question, how do people who want to oh, yeah. do free range parenting or, or let grow as you're calling it now, mm -hmm. how do you do that in a world where you can get arrested? Yeah, um, so I, I, I gave lectures about this for 10 years and said, so we have to free range our kids. And then somebody wrote to me and said, how can we free range our kids? Uh, you need a law that says it's legal. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, I didn't think about that. That's true. So then I started ending my lectures always saying, eh, we have to free range our kids. We have to make it normal again to let our kids go outside. And you know, if you don't want to, that's okay. But if I want to, I, I would like it if there were other kids out there too. And then we have to make it legal. And after hearing one of my lectures, uh, Lincoln Fillmore, uh, who is a state senator in Utah, thought it made sense. And he drew up a law and he called it the free range parenting law. And it said, it's not negligence to let your kids um, play outside, walk to school, wait briefly in a car under some mm. circumstances, or come home with a latch key. And if anybody is reported for those things, absent any other evidence of something actually wrong, like, you know, the child is chained to the radiator, uh, then it's not abuse or neglect. And it passed both houses in Utah unanimously and was signed into law this past spring. It was the first free, they called it the free range parenting law. Um, now you can call it a let grow law. I really don't care what you call it, but um, I would love more states to pass a similar law that says really what neglect is, is blatant disregard for a child's welfare. It's mm. not you raising your kid differently from my, uh, nobody thinks that anybody else is raising their kid right. I mean, every sister-in-law and every brother-in-law, I can't believe they do it that way. So um, unless we're talking blatant disregard, that shouldn't, um, that shouldn't be a legal issue. Uh, if you don't want to, if you don't want to try to pass a whole law in your state, uh, you can try passing a proclamation mm. in your town. That's what uh, the town of Ithaca, New York, just did. Mm. I think Wilton, Connecticut, is thinking about something similar, where you say we want kids out and about, sure. and rather than thinking the worst of their parents, we will support the parents and. You can go up to kid. Are you, are you okay? Are you lost? Are you fine? Okay, you know your way home. Good. Rather than calling, guess what? I just saw a child yeah. out here. And I think people would rather live in those communities. I would. Yeah. I mean, I would rather know that my neighbors care about my kids and are giving me the benefit of the doubt than they can't wait to uh, turn me in. And uh, what's strange about some of these 911 calls is they are so mad at a mother or a father taking their eyes off their kid that they can't wait till the mother goes to jail right. <laughs> for a year to take their eyes off their kids. So it's there's something strange going on. But once again, I feel like that too has been primed by a really um, distorted idea of when children are safe or unsafe. We really have come to this strange new conclusion that if your eyes are on your kid, they're safe. And if you turn away, I mean, yeah. literally people think if you turn away, you turn back and they'll disappear. When those people are writing these Facebook posts about, I thought my child was going to be taken from me. Thank God I didn't look at my phone. Yeah. I think they truly believe that had they looked down, they would look up and their child would be on the streets of Thailand or something. They, they, there's no, there's very little grip on boring, old, plain, pretty safe reality. Yeah, I mean, a sign of how strange the times are is that we're now having to pass laws and proclamations saying, okay, this activity is not illegal. I mean, that's a, a kind of strange law if you think about it. Uh, it but is. I mean, we need this, uh, I mean, you're, it seems like there has to be this cultural shift in these right. at a community level in order to normalize, you, you have to have an environment where that's normal uh, in order, mm -hmm. and there will hopefully be some sort of, uh, you know, add on effect there. And it, it's, I guess that's what the, the Let Grow project is, is right. all about. Right, I was just writing and, Let Grow project, yeah. but I was gonna say another thing first, which is that if I gave yet another name <laughs> to what I'm working on and what a lot of other people are working on now, I would call it the benefit of the doubt movement. Let's mm. give parents the benefit of the doubt. Let's give strangers the benefit of the doubt. Let's give our neighbors the benefit of the doubt. Most of us are doing the best we can 
if we haven't taken the kid into the store, it could be because we're working two jobs, it's exhausting, the kid has uh, you know, tuberculosis, we don't want to give it to everybody else. Just sort of assume that everybody is doing their best unless you see something egregious and that is statistically likely to hurt a child. Four minutes a car is not statistically likely to kill anybody, otherwise we'd all be dead at the time of freight train came by and we had to wait in the car for it to pass. So you really have to try to recalculate towards sort of generosity um, towards your fellow human beings and a little less hysteria when it comes to um, how, uh, how terrible the world is because we are living in the safest times ever. We're at a 50 year crime low here in the United States. We're back to the crime rate of 1963. We really are, um, we're almost ungrateful that we are living in a time where, you know, in America, where we don't have a, a war on our soil, there's no famine, the water supply, unless you're in Flint, is, is you know, safe, the food supply, unless you're romaine lettuce. Is, I mean, basically, the fact that I can say two exceptions means that most things are decent now, and we're acting as if it's World War Three out there. So how do you renormalize all of this? How do you get the kids back outside so that your neighbors are used to seeing them there, so they don't call 911 when they see one like an escaped lemur from the zoo. So the Let Grow project in schools is simple, fast, and free. And the schools that are doing it, yeah, that's our website right there, Let Grow. And you click on schools, that second um, little tab down there, and you'll you'll be um, led to a little video that shows the Let Grow project in action, which is teachers tell the kids to go home and do one thing on their own. That's all they have to do. We give them a list. But they don't have to take something from the list, but the list is there. And um, because you decide it with your parents, it's something that they are ready for you to do, even though we are giving a little push. And like I was saying before, that's really, it just breaks the ice. The, mm. This fear, like I can't let my kids do anything. It's so scary. No, it turns into, look at my kid. But the other uh, Let Grow initiative that we have that we're doing through schools is Peter Gray's idea. And it's keeping the schools open after school for free play. Uh, because of what we were talking about. Yeah, that's Peter Gray's fantastic book. Oh my God, I love that book. It's so, so great. Yeah, I just um, read it. Big fan as you well. You read it? Yeah, I did. Yes. Yeah. Um, After I saw you, you read it? Yeah. Yes, right. yes, I did. And uh, I want to implement it. But the, again, you run into these challenges of being in a big city where no one has this mindset. But I'm hoping that right. initiatives like Let Grow are going to you know, create these little these little zones, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, anyway, so I was just gonna say the reason that we, uh, we want schools to stay open for free play is that in free play you learn, you know, the compromise and the creativity, leadership, um, frustration tolerance, because you and your friends are coming up with something to do and you're making it happen. And at a, a let grow play club, which is what we call it, because we're slavishly trying to pound our name into people's heads, let grow play club, um, it's it's at the school so parents trust where the kids are the parents who wouldn't necessarily let their kids go to the local park let them stay at school so it's also convenient if you're working you don't have to get go and get your kid uh there's mixed ages there and peter gray said that one of the things that our culture has lost is ages playing together because if you're in little league it's the seven and eight year olds and it's the nine and ten year olds but if you have a 12 year old playing and there's all different ages and the five year old comes up to bat the 12 year old is going to throw it gently. I mean, they're just going to inherently, instinctively throw it gently to the five year old. And that is the beginnings of empathy. And the five year old, who, if he was playing with his parent, might say, I want another turn. That's not fair. You know, and be a baby. They don't want to be a baby around the cool 12 year old or even the cool seven year olds. So they suck it up and they go to the back of the line. And that's the beginnings of maturity. And so it has always been. And we've taken that opportunity out of our kids' lives as well. I realize I'm drifting to the wrong side. Sorry. <laughs> so right. um, so if you have a free play club after school, you have an adult on premises in case there's any kind of emergency. And, uh, and then you have a place that people uh, think is safe and is safe. And then um, you have kids off their devices. So I know a lot of parents are worried about that. So you have three hours after school when they're coming up with things to do on their own. And uh, there was something else great about it. It's a safe place. There's a, there's a person there for an emergency. Oh, and there's enough kids. 
Because right. so many times what I hear from parents and what I think I'm hearing from you is you want to have your kid outside playing, you know, part of a pack like when you were a kid, yeah. but there's no kids outside. And exactly. that's because the kids are in um, either a, you know, an adult led activity somewhere or um, or they're home on their devices. So this is this is a third place. And it doesn't cost much. You just have to have some grown up there and then you're using the same facilities that are there for the rest of the day so it doesn't even make new insurance problems for the school so it's it's we've tried to come up with the simplest possible things to do and these are them that's, these are the school initiatives that's that's great and uh, i want to show just a last clip of the night is just a little promo video of of the fr the free play um, that oh, yeah. you made on your site. And uh, so people can take a look and get a sense of what goes on there. And then we'll come back and just uh, get uh, you to tell people how they can make this happen in their own community. Oh, great. Yay. Thanks. So we'll be right <laughs> back. It's not your imagination. Kids are getting more anxious, depressed, hypersensitive. And you'd be too if you were micromanaged. We tell them what to do from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to bed. What's missing? Old-fashioned free play. You probably played after school. Best part of your day. But today, kids are in organized activities or on electronics. Or even if they want to go out and play, there's no one outside to play with. Solution? Keep schools open for free play before or after school. Seven schools in a Long Island, New York school district started the Let Grow Play Club. The first rule of Play Club is adults do not intervene in Play Club. Initially, when we decided we were going to run this club and we were going to have a hundred or more children in one area playing and we didn't want any adults intervention, I was a little nervous. Why not have adults organize the activities? Because kids figuring things out is the point of play. Can I play? Okay. Go. Play is how children learn to direct their own activity. It's how lear they learn to create activities. It's how they learn to negotiate differences with their playmates. All of that is destroyed when you've got an adult running it. Okay, so let's get an action item coming out of this. People who uh, are inspired by that or think that's really cool and want that for yeah. their own children, what's the next step? All right, info at letgrow.org is how you can write to us. But go to letgrow.org and you click on schools and you will see that video about Play Club, the Let Grow Play Club, there it is, and, um, and the video and also instructions for the Let Grow project. Uh, all of our materials are completely free. Talking to me on the phone, you can do it tomorrow. Actually, tomorrow I'm pretty busy. You can do it later in the week. It's all free. Um, we, we respond to our emails. We're happy to talk to teachers, principals, superintendents. We really like the superintendents. And uh, there, these are not crazy, difficult initiatives, especially the LECRO project. Uh, and we started something also, um, if you look on our site, on my blog posts like a couple of days ago, John Height and I did a Let Grow meetup for families who wanted to meet each other because maybe you can't get your school to do any of these things immediately, but you wanna find some local people who are willing to send their kids out and you'll send your kids out and you have to sort of renormalize it again. So what we did is we, we announced it on meetup.com and on Facebook and on Twitter, you know, anybody who wants to come meet up and, and we, we met in Washington Square Park under the arch and the children, including John's nine-year-old, all went off to a playground in one corner of the park. It's a big park. And then the adults just, we got a lecture. We got another, that's why I keep hearing John Hyde. That was like my third time that week of hearing a lecture from John Hyde about what happened to childhood. And uh, what was great is that the kids had a fantastic time and they met some of the other kids in the neighborhood who now they can go to the park together with because the parents are used to being separate from the children and the children have met friends and they're used to being on their own too. So it's it's all about renormalizing basically my childhood. If we're just trying to make everybody's childhood back to Lenore's childhood and probably Zach's childhood where kids played outside, they had some spats, they had a lot of fun and they came home and they had cookies and milk. 
That uh, sounds good to me. And uh, I want to thank you for this conversation, Lenore. I could yeah. literally talk to you for another hour. Maybe it's the all point right. of uh, <laughs> my life that I'm in right now, but it's all really fascinating to me. And uh, I appreciate uh, what you're doing. And I hope everyone <laughs> who uh, enjoyed this conversation does go to letgrow.org. And okay. thank you for tuning in for the second installment of this. I was glancing at the chat every now and then. I see people yeah. are having fun in their own conversation down there which is great oh, that's wow. what, that's, what, that. that's huh. what this is all about we're trying to create a little bit of a, a forum here so if you like what we're doing please let us know if you don't like what we're doing I, I guess you can let me know uh, just uh, yell at me on Twitter or something uh, and <laughs> again <laughs> again we'll have <laughs> we'll have uh, I thought you were anti, all about being anti. I know, I know, I'm off message. (laughs) Uh, So um, we will be back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, talking to Rick Doblin about something a little bit different, psychedelics. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, And again, uh, if you want, if you have questions for Nick Gillespie about postmodernism, do hit us up at questions at reason.com. All right, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Mm